I, I, I am very happy to be here today. Uh, I am really excited to introduce Camp Hearn to uh, our neighbors to the north. And uh, we are really excited about our progress. We have a lot more to do. I, I must tell you that it was not just foundations and it was not private monies and it wasn't the, our, just our local governments that helped us get where we were. I have to tell you that Chet Edwards did a, a lot for us to get us uh, an earmark, if you want to call it that. But it has already proved to be a very big financial <coughs> boom for Hearn, and I think it will be even greater as, as we proceed. I also want to tell you that, and this is my out, so if you have any hard questions, I want you to know that I am not a historian. And the real scholars to this issue of internment of prisoners of war or uh, uh, European alien uh, Americans that were interned during the war, those experts are right here on campus. It's uh, Dr. Michael Waters who did the archaeological survey and it's Dr. Arnold Kramer who has written several books uh, detailing the, this information. So I am just the storyteller. So if you ask the hard questions, I may not have those answers. Anyway, if uh, usually when I talk about Camp Hearn, it's for a very short period of time, and I, my biggest problem is that I have to put some context to, okay, you had prisoners of war in Hearn, Texas, and why is that? What I try to do on this little timeline, like every little history class, is to kind of give context to where we are. The problem is that it really started a little bit earlier. If we were to go to the next slide, in 1936, the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, the Army and the Navy uh, intelligence offices began making lists of aliens in this country that they felt could be a security risk to the United States. Uh, even in 1940, there was an act called the Alien uh, registration act and they had to basically every alien had to go register at the post office and so the, we knew who they were and where they were and it turned out that there was about five million aliens registered aliens living in the United States uh, obviously over that same period of time if you remember the serials at the movies and everything uh, there was a, a lot of fear that there was a fifth column in the United States the fifth column was the uh, ubiquitous uh, uh, undertow where uh, there was Nazis in every corner. Uh, so there was kind of a fear, in a, and we feared more Germany than we ever did. We didn't really fear Japan at the time. But of course, uh, at Pearl Harbor, that changed everything. And immediately, immediately, they began to arrest people of alien ancestry, whether it be Japanese, uh, German, or Italian. Um, anyway, let's see. I said that. I, see, this is why I wanted to move. I can't. I can't read this down here. Uh, I think it is important to note. There's an interesting thing about the FBI and the Naval Intel Intelligence uh, Offices during. Uh, the summer of 1941, the Naval Intelligence Office broke into the Japanese uh, consulate in LA. They got into the safe, they photographed everything in the safe, they put everything back the way it was, and according to the intelligence officer, they had the local police outside the door, they had the FBI in photographing everything, and they even had a safe cracker that they had to break out of jail. So uh, by even before Pearl Harbor, we actually already knew who the spies were in Southern California. And we knew where they were and where we could go get them. So it wasn't very hard for the FBI to immediately jump in. And because of these massive lists of supposed terrorists or spies or saboteurs, that they were able to, uh, within days, arrest an awful lot of folks. Actually, J. Edgar Hoover was more worried about the German Americans, that, that second generation, than he was about the actual aliens living in the United States because the German Americans could assimilate 
and they could be better spies. And so J. Edgar had a lot of quirks, but certainly that was one of them. There's something interesting that happened on February the 15th. We had already arrested these folks, not, not all the Japanese or Japanese Americans, but we had already arrested several folks on the West Coast. And on February 15th, FDR was giving one of his famous fireside chats. 15 minutes into that fireside chat, the United States was shelled. Now, when I saw this on this little map over here, I thought, oh no, America was never bombed during the war. If I ever learned it in school, I certainly forgot it. But actually, there was a lone submarine that was off the coast of Southern California and managed to throw two shells at an oil refinery just off the coast of Santa Barbara. Well, this sent the West, California, and, you know, Oregon, uh, Washington into a frenzy because they thought they were being uh, bombarded by the Japanese, which was really a truly big fear at the time. What happened after that on February 19th was that uh, FDR did sign the executive order 1066. And what this did was establish some military zones in the West Coast that where if you were an alien, and this all depended on the military commander at the time, he could set the zone, he could decide who was going to be arrested and who was not going to be arrested. And as it turned out, it was that particular, uh, wasn't legislation, but executive order that allowed for the relocation of 120,000 Japanese and Japanese uh, Americans. Now, if we were to go on to the East Coast, on June 12th, this one I kind of remembered. I think there was a movie made or something. I kind of remember that there were eight saboteurs that were landed by submarine off uh, Long Island, and that their, their main uh, mission was to uh, destroy the power plants in Niagara Falls and three different Alcoa plants in Illinois, Tennessee, and New York. Well, there was another establishment of military zones, and it was on the East Coast. Well, there was no Japanese on the East Coast, so what does that mean? We're looking at Germans, we're looking at Italians, and any other Axis power. Uh, the problem was, there's a whole lot of those folks out there. And it just really kind of points to the, to the fact that if we go to the next slide, the relocation program that we had for the Japanese was considerably different from the internment program that we had for suspected spies and sub saboteurs. And uh, you have to say at this point that, that certainly the relocation of the, of the Japanese, there was a fear and it was probably racist. Uh, the enemy aliens, on the other, other hand, it was more selective, and they came up with a term that they used, it was called Individual uh, Exclusion Program, where instead of doing the entire group of aliens, uh, they selectively chose which ones they were going to intern. A lot of people never realized that we had interned German Americans or Italian Americans. These are the camps where they were interned at. And there were three here in Texas. It was Crystal City, uh, Sigaville, and Kennedy. In the Crystal City camp, actually, they interned uh, several folks, but they even allowed their families to join them if they wanted to. So, and for some unbelievable reason, we even told South America that if they would send their German aliens to the United States, we would intern them as well. Why, I have no idea. But there's an answer, I'm sure, in that book. <laughs> Again, we go back to my little timeline. What does this have to do with Hearn? Well, if we look at the next slide, that X represents March 1942. That's kind of early in the war. Our activity was really a little bit later. You see our first raid was uh, the Doolittle Raid on April the 12th. So Hearn, Hearn's uh, business center or their chamber of commerce was requesting for an internment camp to be hosted at Hearn uh, way before we thought we had any prisoners of war. If you go to the next slide, uh, we actually started building the camp in September. 
Again, this was months, six weeks before we ever invaded North Africa. And there was a true, true belief that the United States was going to intern in mass German and Italian uh, persons of ancestry, uh, first, second generations. If you go to the next slide, uh, again, that's the six weeks before the invasion. Uh, the next slide, the Nazis or, or, or the German army, the forces, didn't even uh, surrender in North Africa until May of 1943. The next slide shows you an interesting document, and this is on uh, display at the camp. In June of 1943, we received our first German prisoners. And if you look at the very, very top up there, it says, note, the title of this camp has been officially changed to the prisoner of war camp, Hearn, Texas. So before we actually considered ourselves a prisoner of war camp, there was a, a true expectation that we were going to house German Americans, Italian Americans. Now, that never happened, as we said. We, it did happen on a small scale, certainly not a large scale. Uh, one of the ironies of this is that they bought the land. They bought 700 acres to put the camp up. The U.S. Army bought the land from several of our Brazos Valley Italian Americans. <laughs> Uh, one of the comments that uh, FDR made was that he wasn't worried about the Italians because all they did were sing opera songs, and that, uh, but he was worried about Germany or Germans because the, he did feel that the Germans were the more uh, dangerous group. Okay, having said that, we're back at North Africa, and this is where Camp Hearn as a prisoner of war camp really started. The number of POWs that surrendered in North Africa was 275,000 soldiers. Uh, I won't take you back through the whole history, but primarily the, uh, what happened was uh, Hitler insisted that Rommel return to Germany and left his folks stranded. They were, they were unable to cross the Mediterranean into Sicily from Tunisia. A lot of people say, well, how in the world did the POWs get to Hearn? Well, we sent thousands of tons of ammunition, supplies, uh, equipment, millions of men over to North Africa uh, via our cargo ships. Well, those were empty now, and there was nothing to bring home except 275,000 prisoners. <laughs> It, the, Brit, the Brits really had no way of taking care of another 275,000 folks. So we basically inherited all of those prisoners from that time. What they did once they got into uh, the United States is that they traveled by Pullman car to Hearn, Texas. This is the Geneva Conventions at work. Uh, we, we, we had to treat every prisoner, every soldier, the same way we would treat our own soldiers of equal rank. That means if a private got to sit in a Pullman car, a prisoner of war private did the same. The next slide shows you how many actually were uh, interned over the course of the war. We had many more Germans than we had uh, Italians or Japanese. And Hearn did have a small complement of Japanese towards the end of the war. We'll go into that in a minute. If you, the next slide shows you where these prisoner of war camps were. One of the interesting things about the Geneva Convention, it said that not only when you captured them did you have to take care of them, but you also had to keep them in the same climates. So a lot of our southern, a lot of our southern uh, camps were because it was almost directly in line on the same latitude as North Africa. The next, camp, the next one shows you the main camps that are in Texas. We had main camps and we had branch camps. Uh, Hearn, Huntsville, Mahia, uh, some of the others were, were what we called large base camps. We had at least three to 5,000. There was 50,000 total in, in Texas. One of the things we do for the school children is we do a little program called How Texas Won the War. And uh, we talk about all of the contributions that Texas made that was above and beyond. Uh, 
and it's really well received I and mean, it kind of goes through all the tax things that the kids need to know and there's not too many places in America where you can actually take a child out and say a German soldier stood here so we're kind of proud of our camp we have a unique niche into teaching. Hearn was selected because uh, what the Corps of Engineers had decided was the perfect place for a camp it had to be at least two, 350 acres it had to be 170 miles from the coast, that's so they couldn't escape and get into submarines. They had to be five miles from a railroad, which were a little bit closer. Uh, and the train had to be very level. Well, Hearn doesn't look like it's necessarily level, but if you go down 485 uh, towards the river, the river bottom kind of bottoms out real quick. <laughs> so it is rather level where the site of the camp is. This is the layout of the camp, and it had over 250 buildings. And remember, this went up from uh, September. It was actually finished in November. So uh, it was a pretty busy place. Our locals got work. Uh, the Corps of Engineers came in. Uh, it was just very, very busy. The next slide, please. Uh, one of the interesting things, or it's just kind of a did you know, the bob wire around the camp, and uh, there was a double fence. It was 10 feet tall. Uh, there was all around the perimeter of the camp. The camp itself was only about 56 acres. But there was enough bob wire in those fences to stretch 180 or 1,800 miles. Now, that's enough to go from here to <coughs> Chicago and back. So there was a lot of wire there. The camp was uh, separated into the American sector. Of course, there was administration buildings and guards and everything. And a lot of the reading I've done about the selective service and the initiation of, of a, lot, a pool of Americans into the US Army, they were worried that they wouldn't like it. And so all of their camps were required to have canteens, PXs, theaters. At the end of the war, they did a statistical analysis of uh, the theater visits by U.S. soldiers, and it was like in the millions. It was unbelievable. But they wanted to make sure that our troops were entertained. Well, that also meant that the prisoners were entertained. So, but anyway, we had one of the larger camps. Uh, the, we had three compounds. Each compound was separated by a single eight single fence eight foot high and each compound had uh, four different companies of men and and in the prisoner of war uh, population they had they generally or they did uh, recognize the ranks of the different people and so the highest ranking officer was in control etc one of the things that was interesting before the war uh, we built this barrack to house our exhibit. And the barracks were 20 feet wide by 100 feet long. And for you men that were in the service, uh, that barrack was supposed to house initially 32 men. Each man had a space of 60 square feet. After Pearl Harbor, the mass of enlistments was so large that they just had to change everything. And you only had 40 square feet. <laughs> that means the same structure now housed 50 men in each quadrant, <coughs> very small. Of course, it also, Geneva Conventions required that we have a recreation area. It required that we took care of the prisoners and that we gave them uh, health and there were sanitary uh, conditions. Uh, the camp has a complete, you know, it's a little city within itself. It had a complete sewer system, water system, electrical, everything. Uh, the next slide shows what we called, it was kind of nicknamed the Black Beauty. This was the typical building that was on the camp. Again, it was a 20 by 100 foot building. Uh, depending on where it was located, whether it was in the southern part of the states or in the northern part of the states, dictated whether or not it was actually finished, insulated and finished on the interior. Of course, in our area, it, it was not finished. It was kind of bare. The only structures that had cement foundations in our camp 
it were the uh, mess halls, the latrines, administration buildings, warehouses. And usually the prisoners uh, took duty. They were the ones who cleaned up the camp. They were the ones who took care of everything. They even got to the point where they didn't like our cooking and they didn't like our white bread. And so uh, they began, you know, you put 5,000 people together and you're gonna find bakers and plumbers and draftsmen and everything. So they actually started cooking their own food. Uh, they didn't like a lot of our foods either. Uh, so we had to add sauerkraut and frankfurters and sausage. Again, uh, this basically just, if, if you look at the American sector, it looks the same in the uh, POW camp. The next slide shows that uh, we did have labor and, and the uh, enlisted folks, the, the privates were required to work. Uh, they could be, by Geneva Conventions, you could require that those enlisted men work. Uh, the NCOs and above did not have to work unless they just wanted to. Uh, we depended upon, I, I say we, Ahern, America, uh, any rural area depended so much on the uh, work of the prisoner labor that their return to Europe was delayed by about six months just so they could get the harvest in. It was, a, it was really a, a concern that all of that labor was going to leave in our, and we needed the harvest. This is the mail center. And at one time, Hearn distributed all the mail to all the prisoners throughout all the camps in the United States. Now, uh, they said they would distribute like 1.2, it was a huge number of mail items that went back and forth. The prisoners were constantly complaining that everything was delayed. Well, that wasn't much different than our US soldiers, so that wasn't really a problem. <laughs> However, uh, there is part of the problems with all the camps, whether it was in Hearn or elsewhere, was the Nazi activity. The higher the rank, the more likely uh, the Nazi was going to be uh, hardened, hardcore. And the Nazis were bound and determined that they were terribly arrogant and decided they were going to win the war regardless, and this was just a little small, brief episode <laughs> in their lives. And they wanted to make sure that everybody towed the line. And uh, they were warned that if they were taken prisoners that they needed to tow the line. So all of a sudden, our NC, and, and Hearn was one of the camps where they sent what they called the uncooperative Nazis. And the, they were trying to segregate them so that the ones who were anti-Nazi didn't have to suffer all the endure all the beatings that the other guys were giving them. Camp Hearn had a high percentage of uncooperative NCOs. But all of a sudden these non-cooperative NCOs started to volunteer to work in the postal unit. And they tried to figure out, kind of looked at it for a while, and what happened was uh, they figured out a way to, just like Mr. Hoover, make a list. And they were starting to co get, collect data and make lists of people that were not uh, actually towing the line and that may harbor American sympathies. And uh, so they started, it was part of their intimidation. It was just part of the nature. They, they wanted to intimidate and browbeat. They figured out ways to send uh, messages back and forth. Yes, sir? Well, I heard they not, didn't just intimidate, they actually killed. <coughs> Oh yes, that's true. They did. Uh, they they would beat them unmercifully, and there was one one murder at our camp, but there were many more beatings. Our guards tell us that uh, there were so few guards compared to the numbers of prisoners that when night fell, fall fell, they uh, they could hear what was going on, but they didn't dare go in and stop it. One of the things was that they weren't given guns. You know, they only had clubs. And if you had, a, if you had 50 Nazis cutting through wires and going through barracks looking for those that might have sympathies, a guard wasn't gonna step out there with a billy cup. You know, we needed something more. 
uh, but the not, it was part of the, it was part of their nature. It was it was the intimidation that they went through. But they would sneak messages back and forth. They would communicate to different people in different camps. They got so that they uh, would uh, have fraudulent censor stamps so they could get into the mail. They would send one piece of mail back and forth as a dead letter. You know, oh, it's not this guy. No, send it back to them. You know, it all came back to Hearn, and then Hearn would would send it to somebody else, and then the messages would go forth. This went on for a, a long time. They finally figured it out, but they didn't stop it. They didn't know what to do with it. And finally, it was moved, and it was moved to a, a camp back east, and it was then all the mail was handled by a group called the Italian Service Units, which were the Italians that we interned that wanted to volunteer for our service. <laughs> so anyway, they, they started doing all the mail. Uh, the interesting thing about uh, one of the stamps was fashioned after a potato. Anyway, if they weren't working and weren't beating each other up, they, they were allowed to do just about anything they wanted to. And the International Red Cross provided them with all kinds of implements and tools, whatever they wanted. They built the fountains and the statuaries. They, they got to make their place beautified. They also, up in the far corner, they learned to do wood carving. And then the next one is they played soccer. They'd have intramurals. And then uh, they would stage concerts. Hearn was kind of unique in that most of our uh, residents or prisoners of war were from Rommel's elite Africa Corps. But we also got to capture the Rommel's orchestra. And we got to capture the instruments. So we had the best orchestra in the land <laughs> for about three years. Uh, they also got to rest in the canteen. And Dr. Waters talks about uh, they would be given coupons if they worked so much. You know, they'd, it, they didn't have money. It was a coupon. And he said that they would get together and, and uh, they would form these little drinking clubs because, you know, one coupon wasn't, you know, if you only had one coupon and one beer, you weren't going to get a buzz. So they had these little drinking clubs where they'd pull together their, their coupons and it would be this guy's turn to have, you know, the six beers in one night. But, uh, you know, they had nothing else to do. They had all the time in the world to think these things up. So. <laughs> Basically, everybody says, well, why did we treat them so nice? Well, it's because our mothers told us that we do unto others. I don't care what religion, I would say most religions have the golden rule in some way, fashion. It's just simply you do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And it's interesting, uh, uh, Confucius, uh, he, some of his followers said, you know, Master, give me one word that I should practice my life. And he said, reciprocity, do unto others. That is the culture and the uh, civilization. That's what we all grew up to believe. Now, we all know that's in the good book, but if you're in the U.S. Army in 1942, what book were you looking at? It was the manual, right? They had manuals for everything. And uh, it, the, w one of the things that uh, I found amazing when I started looking for the soldier's manual, just the basic infantry guy out there, I found hundreds of manuals. I couldn't believe they could print so much. But in this particular one, this is from the field manual 19.5. It's for military police. And I wanted to make sure I got this right, so let me read this to you. And it says, it is important that all military personnel to be fully informed of these provisions as a protection in the event of their own capture. And because violation of any of such provisions is not only a violation of the laws of the United States, it also, but may also result in retaliation by the enemy against our own prisoners of war and may subject this nation to unfavorable criticism in the public opinion of the people throughout the world. That's what they lived by. It was the manual. That's what they were told to do, and that's what we did. Uh, 
the next slide just shows you that they spent a lot of time doing arts and crafts, and that was okay. They were, you know, we were the good guys, we're gonna let them do this. We also taught them, uh, they could go to class, they could, we taught them English. We, uh, any subject that we could find instructors for and they wanted to take, we would, we would provide that. Uh, now, that makes us out to be awfully good, right? Well, maybe not. What we were actually doing, and this was not known to, uh, this was not even known to Congress at the time, but the U.S. Army had decided to have a secret re-education program. And in this secret education program, it was, the whole idea was to win the hearts and minds of the German people. It was pretty obvious in 1943 that we were gonna win the war. Uh, and we wanted those Germans to go back and be beacons of democracy. We didn't want them to go back and continue the Nazi. Uh, it was so secret. Uh, and a little, and maybe, maybe you might think that it's really against uh, the Geneva Conventions, which it was. The Geneva Conventions specifically say you can't have the propaganda, you can't try to, to brainwash somebody into your, indoctrinate them into your own uh, political way of life. So it was kind of uh, interesting that we, we kind of did it on the sly. There is one important thing that we did do. Uh, when the uh, Allied forces started uh, liberating the concentration camps and our prisoner of war camps, things changed drastically. Uh, before that, uh, the prisoners were getting a 2,000, 2,500 calorie diet if they worked. When we saw what happened to our guys, when we saw what was going on in the concentration camps, uh, things changed remarkably. They only got about anywhere from 1,000 to 1,200 calories. They had harder work details. Uh, things didn't, weren't just real nice. They were all forced to, to look at the films that we were taking, and they were all forced to see that before we sent them home. A lot of them didn't really have a clue a lot of them say they didn't have a clue that it was going on. I'm sure that's true for some cases. Remember, it was the SS in charge of the concentration camps. It was the, their regular army that was doing our prisoner of war camps, and they really didn't have a whole lot of food to give our prisoners either. One of the things the, the gentleman mentioned that everybody wanted to come back, well, what happened after the war is that we packed them up in Hearn pretty quick. Packed them up and sent them back. Uh, but they all ended up either in England, France, Holland, and they ended up being uh, used as forced labor for about two years. Uh, and this was by design. It, it, not particularly, we were not in control of it in those areas, but Europe was a mess and they needed help, and they needed a labor force. And so these, a lot of these prisoners uh, ended up in work camps somewhere. An unbelievable thing, and I, you know, I never really thought about it much uh, until recently, but uh, there is a term called disarmed enemy forces. And I thought, well, what is that? And what it was is after the war, and after they had split up Germany, all of a sudden, in two months' time, there was like, oh, 500, uh, I mean, uh, five or five to seven million Axis forces that were surrendering in mass. We couldn't take care of 500,000. In Europe, you certainly can't afford to feed seven million prisoners of war the same way you're feeding your own soldiers. What happened was they decided that any prisoner that surrendered after uh, the laying down of arms in, in May would not be a prisoner of war anymore, that they would simply be a disarmed enemy uh, force. And therefore, they weren't entitled to the Geneva Conventions. It was a matter of true survival. Uh, the, Europe was in a devastating slump. They had no food. It was 
disaster everywhere. But Germany, there were seven million disarmed individuals helped pick up every stone, so it works out. Most of them did make it home, but it did take about two years. Most of them were released by, by at least uh, 1948. So what are we doing in Camp Hearn? <coughs> Camp Hearn is laid under brush and trees and uh, just all kinds of things. When After the war, I think we were, t by 1947, the whole camp was uh, dismantled. All 250 buildings were sold off. A lot of them went to our churches to become uh, uh, all the uh, uh, hospitality rooms. A lot of them went to our schools. Uh, there are people all over this county and Milam County and Robertson County that use them for barns. Uh, churches, whatever. Uh, it went for army surplus. The war was over, people were tired, they just, you know, get it out of here. Uh, they found out that they had, it was like seven miles of water pipe, uh, 11 miles of electrical line. They even stripped off the gravel off the road and sold it. So the U.S. Army pretty much got rid of everything. The only thing left in, uh, at the camp now, if you, this is the overlay on top of a Google map. So if you go to the next screen, the little white uh, area up there, that's the area that we have cleared. And those are the uh, cement foundations of the actual buildings that were on there. Most of those were, uh, the larger buildings were warehouses, the longer buildings were mess halls. You know, it, it's just a reminder of what was there. It's what we call in the next foot, uh, next slide, we call that the footprint. That same footprint is, is out in the woods and all of those different compounds where the prisoners actually were. And it, it is kind of neat to go back and look. Uh, also, we have a lot of those, those fountains that they were building. Uh, the pretty women are gone, but the, the bases are there. Uh, it's just a, it's just kind of unusual, and we feel that it, it's an unusual place to visit, and uh, we know that the kids love it, and we know the kids think we fought Russia, so <laughs> they need help to understand uh, what World War II was like. We also wanted to uh, be sure in the next slide, we have a lot of stories at Camp Hearn. We have stories of our locals doing, doing wonderful things. Uh, our farmers produced cotton. Uh, Dr. Waters uh, archeological dig provided us with many artifacts and objects that are in our, uh, our exhibit. And we have the slabs. And you can't go on one of those slabs and just, but you think back and think who was wa walking on this. It was not only the Germans, but it was also our US soldiers as well. It's what we did as a home front, and I think that's really, really important. Just to give you an idea, in this next slide, I don't know that you can read that, but in 1939, we had at best maybe 200,000 uh, soldiers. 200,000 soldiers. Germany in 1939 had six million soldiers. We weren't ready for war in 1939 but it didn't take us long to get going. And by the end of the war, we had 10 million men and women in the service. You know the stories about what we built. Uh, and we also fed the world. If you go to the next slide, Hearn, Hearn did its part. This is out of the Hearn newspaper in 1943. We did the rations. Down here it says, married women may serve in the Navy. That's pretty unique in 1943. Uh, but Hearn did its part as well as the rest of the world. The propaganda posters, uh, the next slide shows that truly the home front was the second front uh, and that we always beat the promise. And if you look at just the story of industrialization, it's just uh, an amazing, amazing feat. And what we want to do at Camp Hearn is not only talk about uh, the prisoner of war camp and what the prisoners did and what we did, 
but also what America did and what rural America did to help contribute to uh, the defeat of National Socialism in Germany. If the, the next slide just shows you what's out there now. We have our new barrack. Uh, the front part of the barrack is pretty bland and we're trying to get uh, kids to uh, take on projects to build foot lockers and bunks and, and uh, different things that would go in like a, a soldier would have used. And then we also have a lot of the artifacts and things that uh, and objects from Dr. Waters excavation, also just from memorabilia from different people that lived in the area. The uh, prisoners would paint pictures, and most of the pictures they would paint would either be of the Alps or they'd be of the compound, and because that's all they saw. And uh, what they'd do is they'd barter with the guards. They'd give them a picture for maybe cigarettes or whatever the thing of the day was. So, if, so our locals and a lot of our locals, and I know there's probably some here in Brazos County, probably have something hanging somewhere that, that may have come from one of our camps. Over here there's a wood carving of an a Indian head, and I saw another one of those on eBay, and I thought, how in the world did these two guys get together you know, to do this ugly Indian head? And then I started thinking, remember the buffalo nickel? Remember what's on the back side of the buffalo nickel? It's an Indian head. Well, they only did what they saw. So a lot of the, what we see uh, is, is just what they remember and what they saw. I am way over. I have a lot more to tell you. So you have to come to the camp. No, no, no. I, thank you.